Uh, the, the conferences, the last one was in Milwaukee, are always uh, spectacular, wonderful, interesting events. Um, if you want to know more about that, uh, check out their website at oah.org. So tonight I'm going to talk um, about black northerners. I know that if those of you, how many people were at Kate Mazur's talk? Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> so you heard her talk about, uh, about Spielberg's Lincoln, and in part, I suspect, about the absence of, of black characters from that movie. Uh, I'm going to follow up on that um, from a slightly different direction. I, I agree with Steven Spielberg and with the national consensus that the Civil War was an epochal, world-shaking event, uh, maybe the central event in American history. It reconfigured the politics of the nation. It reconfigured the cultural life of the nation. 800,000 people now, we think, died as a result of Civil War combat, uh, more than all the rest of our wars put together. Um, but most of all, we cherish and wrestle with the legacy of the Civil War because it led to slave emancipation uh, and to the freeing of nearly four million people from lifetime hereditary bondage and, in very short order, their transformation into formally equal participants in the national project. That's a mighty transformation and one uh, that bears some investigation, you might say. What is not so commonly understood, I think, even at this late date, even after a century of excellent historical scholarship, and especially after the last 40 years of historical scholarship, is that black people were themselves the engines of that transformation. <coughs> black people brought freedom, and black people tethered freedom to equality. You wouldn't know that watching Spielberg's Lincoln. You wouldn't know that even watching Quentin Tarantino's Django, right? That would not really occur to you because in, in neither of those movies are African Americans the central actor, agents of liberation, uh, an individual in Django is. But the rest of the people around him seem cowed, helpless, not able to do it. And in Spielberg's Lincoln, it's even worse. But to begin with, American slaves seized freedom. They had been told by slaveholders for years, in some cases for decades, that up there in the North there were these ad wicked abolitionists who had in mind nothing so much as disrupting their social and cultural world uh, and, and sowing discord and ruin. S Southern slaveholders had been telling each other that story. They had been telling non-slaveholding Southerners that story. Slaves listened to that story. And when the Union Army arrived in slaveholding territory in 1861, slaves tested that hypothesis. And by testing that hypothesis, by presenting themselves to the Union Army, they ultimately transformed the Union Army into an engine of their liberation. Um, they, they fled their owners, they ran to Union Army camps, they offered their bodies, the strength of their bodies, their knowledge of the woods and the swamps, um, they offered their services as seamstresses, as teamsters, as laborers, as ditch diggers, as servants, they made themselves indispensable to the Union Army. And their scars and their stories instructed Union soldiers in the meaning of slavery in a way that not even Uncle Tom's Cabin had done before. By the middle of the war, uh, many of those fugitive slaves began to don Union uniforms. And by the end of the war, nearly 200,000 had served the Union Army and Navy, making up a significant fraction of uh, the Union garrison force and military force by the last years of the war. Um, Without their courageous acts of flight to the Union, without their hard labor and their valuable service to it, the war might have remained simply a struggle to put down rebellion. It might never have become a principled struggle against slavery itself. All well and good, and a crucially important story, one we don't know well enough. But I'm here tonight to engage with a much less familiar story of the role that African Americans play in their own liberation and in the transformation of freedom into equality. I'm here to talk about the role played by a much smaller but critically important group of black people, the approximately 250,000 free black people of the non-slave states, in shorthand of the North, although that is not sufficient. Um, they struggled alongside their enslaved compatriots during the war. And I'm going to argue tonight that we can't understand the Civil War without them. Um, we can't understand, in fact, much of what we value about 
the war and its meaning and its legacies springs directly from their ideas, from free black people's ideas, and from their actions. I'm going to make this argument in three parts. First, I'm going to argue that free blacks played a crucial role in causing the Civil War by insisting that the bare freedom available to them in the northern states was not sufficient. Second, I'm going to show how they continued that campaign during the war itself uh, and helped tie the campaign to slave emancipation to a broader campaign for broad human equality, um, for the transformation of the United States into, uh, from a white republic, a republic of, by, and for white people, with black people as secondary characters at best, into a place where all people universally could belong as equal citizens. And finally, third, I'm going to show how that campaign came to grief. Um, the ways that it su succeeded, the ways that it failed, and the ways it shaped the world we live in today. I have about four hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, to begin with, who am I talking about? This is a map of uh, the actual numbers of the black population in the United States in 1850. Uh, this is not a percentage breakdown, this is a numerical breakdown, according to the key here. So, um, the lightest green are counties where there are one to 500 African Americans, and the darkest counties here, the dark purple, from 10 to 50,000. So, not surprisingly, you get to South Carolina, um, the black belt counties of Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, the Delta, and you find you know, enormous concentrations of black people, almost all of them enslaved. But as we go up the East Coast, and even as we go across um, the urban centers of, uh, of, of the lower north, of Pennsylvania and Ohio, we see counties that are not that lightest color green. In other words, counties where there are more than 500 African Americans. Some of them, like New York City, where there are 10,000. Philadelphia, 20,000. Baltimore, a slave state in Maryland, but in Baltimore, 30,000 free black people. That's a lot of free black people in a slave society. But to the north, in, in Massachusetts, the city of Boston, about 2,000 free black people. No slaves at all by 1850. In fact, no slaves since the 1780s. These free black people in small communities, not, not enormous concentrations of population, but communities big enough to sustain spiritual life, uh, an educational life, community life of various kinds. These, these populations stood at the threshold. They were free. They were not slaves. They could not be bought and sold. Their labor belonged to themselves. Their bodies belonged to themselves. Their relationships with their parents, with their spouses, with their children had legal standing. So they were not slaves in any meaningful sense. However, the fact that they were free did not mean that they were equal. We have those things kind of joined at the hip since the Civil War, and especially since the Civil Rights Movement. We think that freedom and equality kind of mean the same thing, but they really didn't. So, what's the location? What did we learn from the location of free black people in the mid-19th century American North? They were citizens of their states, except when they weren't. That is, in some states they have the right to sue and be sued, in others they don't. In some states uh, they have the right to vote, in others they don't. Uh, in other words, in some places they're in a position to protect their freedom at law, and in others, they're simply not. Um, they're presumed to be free, like other free people, but unlike all other free people, they're subject to the fugitive slave law, which means that the burden is on them to prove that they're free, and not the fugitive from slavery who can be drawn back into slavery. Um, they're free, in theory, to rise in a market economy except that virtually every craft and trade is barred to them uh, by the common agreement of white laborers and owners that black people are not to participate in skilled trades. Um, they're free to move about the society, but they're highly segregated in the ways they can move about that society. In fact, when the railroads first begin becoming a dense transportation network in the Northeast uh, in the 1840s and 50s, uh, Massachusetts, which is one of the densest railroad networks in, in the country, uh, begins, the railroad companies in Massachusetts begin attaching a separate car at the end of their trains for black patrons. It's called the Jim Crow car. 
Jim Crow cars first come into existence in Massachusetts. And Massachusetts is where free black people are the freest and most equal of any place. Black men can vote in Massachusetts. In fact, the only disabilities confronting them there are they can't serve in juries, and they can't serve in state militia. And even that's a federal requirement that bars them from that. So even in the, the freest and most equal place in the United States, they're segregated. And worse than segregated, they're mocked. And derided and belittled. This cartoon here is from Philadelphia, but it could, it's also available everywhere else. Um, this is from a uh, series of racist cartoons called Life in Philadelphia from the mid-19th century. And it's very hard to read the caption here. I realize it's a little washed out here. But um, the, the suitor, the man in the back in caricature, is saying, how are you feeling today, Miss Chloe? And Miss Chloe here, you know, elaborately dressed, we can say, right, says to him, oh, I'm mighty fine, but, but I aspire too much. And of course, the joke, the joke it is, is double, right? Because she means perspire not aspire, so she can't, she can't speak correctly. That's part of the joke, right? The other part of the joke is that, indeed, the cartoon's point is she aspires too much. She aspires to a status, which is respectability, even finery, that simply cannot belong to black people. It's ludicrous on its face. This other broadside, um, from a series of broadsides called Bobolition, uh, is even more contemptuous in its way. This one's actually from Boston. Uh, and this represents uh, black men marching, celebrating the abolition of the African slave trade in the early 19th century. And it represents them as so foolish they don't even know what the word for abolition is. They call it bobolition. Great anniversary fussable. That's the, right? This is a racist caricature of black speak speech and action whose purpose is to make black people seem ridiculous and their pretensions to dignity or to citizenship equally ridiculous. Last point on this: um, the most popular form of the, the, the most popular form of public entertainment available in mid-19th century America is the minstrel show, whose purpose is to mock black aspiration, character, and dignity. It's broadly attended, enormously popular. Lincoln loves the minstrel show, right? And that's not the province of a few crackpot white supremacist ideologues. It's broadly popular culture. Um, perhaps the, the very, very worst aspect of all of this is that the most, the most powerful anti-slavery movement in this society is colonization, which is a pretty word for deportation. It says slavery is wrong on some, on some level. It should come to an end at some point. But certainly there is no way that black and white people can share a common republic in freedom. This is a white republic, and therefore freedom must be coupled not with equal citizenship, but with the deportation of emancipated black people to some other home. To Liberia, perhaps, but if not there, somewhere else. As late as August of 1862, oops, we lost something off the top here. Um, this is Lincoln endorsing colonization. My, maybe my slides are not going to fit completely here. Um, Lincoln says to a group of uh, free African Americans visiting him in the White House, essentially, this is not your country. This is our country. I, I, I won't justify it to you. I, I, I can't change it if I would change it. Um, we're both injured by your presence here. It's better if you go somewhere else. And this is the architect of legal emancipation. So what do, what do African Americans do with this? What do they do with this persistent uh, skepticism about their capacity and distancing? They claim it increasingly, uh, explicitly, and loudly uh, from the 1830s through the Civil War. This is one of the key texts in, that begins that moment. It's by a man named David Walker, a North Carolinian who migrated to Boston, became a central figure in the black organizational world of the 1830s, the 1820s and 30s. Um, David Walker published this appeal to the colored citizens of the world that was expressing those of the United States of America as a diatribe against colonization, against slaveholding, against Christianity uh, that, that uh, legitimated slaveholding, um, calling for an equality of right, an equality of dignity between white and black American citizens, calling um, for what, what I would say is a citizenship of the heart. Walker wanted 
the rest of his compatriots wanted a place in the United States that was not simply a matter of right, but a matter of common understanding, right? That, that white Americans would regard them as legitimate fellow members of the body politic, as entitled to that by their labor, by their long residence, by their common investment in an American project as citizens of that nation. Walker, in that sense, is the founder of the modern abolition movement. Because it's only after he articulates this and a community that has long agreed with these principles uh, rallies around these ideas that some white people begin to get the point. Listen to, listen to Walker in 1829. This is from the Appeal to the Colored Citizens. Speaking to white people, throw away your fears and prejudices then and enlighten us and treat us like men and we will like you more than we do now hate you. And tell us no more about colonization, for America is as much our country as it is yours. Treat us like men, and there will be no danger, for we will all live in peace and happiness together. For we are not like you, hard-hearted, unmerciful, and unforgiving. What a happy country this will be if the whites would listen. And lo and behold, a few whites begin to. Most famously, William Lloyd Garrison, who comes to Boston as Walker's pamphlet is published, begins investing himself in the life of the free black community in Boston, and realizes that his former position against slavery as a white person, which was colonization is probably the right answer, was all wrong. He abandons colonization, in fact becomes colonization's fiercest opponent in some ways, and throws himself into the project of pulling more white people into conversation and engagement with the project of black equal citizenship, a wildly unpopular project in the America of the 1830s. But, of course, across the 1830s and 1840s, Garrison and other white men and women uh, in the North begin making coalition with free black communities that have already been well organized to fight for, against slavery and for equal citizenship. And by, the, by 1850, the movement is well enough developed that, that these interracial uh, conventions are becoming a common feature of American life. Now, they're, they're unusual in two regards. One, uh, they include black and white people sitting together. Uh, they also include men and women sitting together, which is nearly unheard of. The abolitionists are not just radicals about uh, race, they're radicals about gender, too. Um, this would have been called a promiscuous assembly, which you all are here as a promiscuous assembly. <laughs> um, but that was very, the, the wording is intentional, right? It, it, it's meant to, make, to suggest there's something very suspect about what's going on here. But look who's here. Um, Frederick Douglass, you may recognize there. Um, a, a number of other people who in their day were famous abolitionists. Behind him, Garrett Smith, the one-term abolitionist congressman. Um, a lot of people together creating an interracial abolitionist movement whose purpose is not simply the end of slavery, but the elevation of white and black to a common fraternal and sororal bond to fellow feeling. In a way, no, not just in a way, for real, um, these people invent the idea of the non-racial republic. They invent the idea that the United States is not a republic of by and for white people, but a republic of pure and simple. Uh, not a popular idea at the time, and not always a popular idea since. But uh, black activists are not only engaging in this work, they're also fighting against slavery, not just with pamphlets, not just in conventions, they're actually literally fighting against slavery. Their political culture includes petition and protest, um, they have a close and growing engagement with the anti-slavery political parties that are emerging, with the Liberty Party, with the Free Soil Party, and finally with the Republican Party. Um, in some places, like Massachusetts, they actually become a small but pivotal constituency for those parties, because the 400 or so black voters on Beacon Hill in, uh, in Boston can actually swing a close election if they all turn out. And when the right political party presents itself to them in the right terms, they do. Uh, so they can actually be a, a real political force in certain small circumstances, despite their tiny numbers. They use that political leverage to argue for what are called personal liberty laws, laws that limit the power of slaveholders to use the fugitive slave law to grab free people in the North and return them, or just drag them, to slavery in the South. Um, 
They also participate in, they use this political leverage to participate in school integration fights on Nantucket, um, finally in Boston, uh, and other places around the North with a little less success. But they're forced by their particular political position to respond in ways other than the normal channels of political discourse. They are not just political militants, but actual military militants. And here's one of my favorite figures from this world. Not only one of the first candidates for black candidates for office in Massachusetts, but also a former slave himself and a militant defender of fugitives, fugitives' rights. Um, when the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 tilts the scales radically in favor of the slaveholders, makes it almost impossible for a person to prove that they're not a slave, and gives all kinds of incentives for commissioners to rule that they are in fact slaves and should be returned to slavery. When the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 takes hold, um, resistance immediately comes from the black communities of the North. They immediately begin fighting against the Fugitive Slave Law, resisting its execution, uh, liberating slaves from courtrooms, liberating slaves from jails. And in uh, 1851, Lewis Hayden is among those who bust into the, the uh, Fugitive Slave Commissioner's courtroom in Boston, bodily pick up a fugitive named Shadrick Minkins, carry him down, hustle him out of the city, and get him up to Montreal, where he spends the rest of his life. Um, this happens in other cities, famously happens with Joshua Glover in Milwaukee, you may well know this story. Um, and these events really put the fear of a black planet into the federal government. Finally, in 1854, uh, a fugitive named Anthony Burns is locked up in the Boston courthouse, and uh, an attempt to rescue him fails, but Lewis Hayden and a number of other white and black abolitionists bust down the door of the Boston courthouse, fight their way inside, kill a constable, and are only driven back because the numbers are weighted heavily against them on the inside. Um, the, next, uh, the next week, the federal government sends 10,000 troops federal, state, and, and city police, um, to escort Anthony Burns to the ship that will take him back to slavery. And it transforms the, um, it transforms the political consciousness in Massachusetts, because all of a sudden, slavery, the slaveholders, are at work in the streets of Boston, and the federal government is doing their bidding. Um, so even though they fail to rescue Anthony Burns, uh, the, the radical activists, black and white, who seek to bust him out of jail, end up catalyzing a political transformation that leaves Massachusetts, at least, committed to an anti-slavery project, whatever the cost. So in other words, when we talk about the black activists of this era, what we're talking about is what people are capable of saying. I have here in my hand a petition to the legislature asking for the integration of the public schools in Boston. If you'll sign it, I'll take it to the, to the governor. Then we'll go get a railroad tie and beat him for the door of the courthouse. I've got a pistol, you should bring one too. <laughs> in other words, people very much like the revolutionaries of 1776, right? Exactly like that in some ways. Okay, I'll stay over here. So by the late 1850s, this, this conflict has led to a series of escalating confrontations uh, in, in, in which slaveholders react to this movement in ways that increase the power of the movement. So um, they insist that Anthony Burns be marched back to slavery, and their, their doing so produces what one historian calls a snap revolution in Massachusetts, in which people look at this spectacle of a man being marched to slavery through the streets of Boston and say, yeah, enough. Amos Lawrence, who's a conservative man, says, we went to bed one night, good, solid, compromised, Union, Webster, Whigs, and woke up stark mad abolitionists. Free black activists do that. Um, slaveholders get the repeal of the Missouri Compromise and the opening of Western territories in the Louisiana Purchase to slavery. The overturning of a 30-year-old compromise. And what, are the, um, what does this provoke? Uh, a civil war in Kansas that radically exacerbates sectional tensions and helps move us towards civil war. The Republicans insist on the Dred Scott decision, reaffirming that black people are not citizens of the United States. And it only emboldens the action that's against it and affirms the Republican Party in its view this is going to take radical change for anything to get better. Also leads to John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. So what do we have? We have a bold interracial social movement spearheaded by black people uh, declaring uh, the universal truth of racial equality and the legitimacy of violent action to defense fugitives. We have state laws passed partly at their behest, but limit the power of slaveholders. 
Um, we have political coalitions that have begun to rest in part on black voters and their recruitment to the cause. What is this? This is the slaveholder's nightmare. And it, not just me intuiting that, it's what they themselves said. When South Carolina leaves the Union in December of 1860, its secession convention issues what it calls the, the Declaration of Immediate Causes. In other words, what has caused us to leave the Union? And what does that declaration say? It says, 14 states have passed state laws making it harder for us to recover our fugitives. They have allowed abolition societies to flourish um, that denounce us as sinful. They've encouraged our slaves to, to, to flee and have given them aid and comfort once they do. And the Republican Party, now the dominant party in the country, having just elected Abraham Lincoln, rests in part on their votes and their citizenship, which the Supreme Court has declared illegitimate. We've got to leave the Union. Who did all of those things? Free black people did all of those things. None of them would have happened without them. Um, so in many respects, and, and I think quite directly, free black people bring the crisis of the Union and lead to the Civil War. Part two. They transform the Civil War into a war for equality. Now, as I said at the beginning, slaves turn the war against the rebellion into a war for freedom. And they do it by imagining that Lincoln's election or the rival of the Union Army means freedom for them, even though Lincoln and the Union Army are saying, no, 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 no. But they make it so. Um, they act on that belief, and they make it clear their labor will serve one side or the other, and by 1862, the Union basically acquiesces in the slaves' vision of what the war is about. Free black people do much of the same work from a different angle. They offer their services from early in the war, but at the beginning of the war, they're, they're just rejected outright. This is a white man's war. Um, after the Emancipation Proclamation, their services are welcomed, and um, key recruiters begin uh, fanning out across the North, uh, recruiting for the first the 54th Massachusetts, and then its sister regiment, the 55th, other regiments from New England states, and finally, the United States Colored Troops, many, many regiments of, of black men from across the North. Um, some of the key recruiters in this are Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, our friend Louis Hayden. This is their ally, the um, white Republican governor of Massachusetts, also an abolitionist and an old friend of many of these people, John Andrew, um, who's the person charged with recruiting the 54th, who knows if he wants to recruit soldiers for the 54th of Massachusetts, he has to turn to black people to do it. And he does. He's smart enough to understand that. By the end of the war, 71% of the eligible free black men in the North served the Union Army. 71%. Okay, the Confederacy, where there's conscription, where the conscription office is so effective that by 1863 they say, there's no one else left to recruit, we got them all, right? Um, the Confederate uh, recruitment pulls in something like 85% of the white men, el eligible, militarily eligible and able white men in the Confederate States. But that's by literally dragging them to war. 71% of free black northerners volunteer. They become most famous for uh, a series of battles like Fort Wagner, uh, the movie Glory uh, culminates in this story. But I think their more important contribution in many ways is by insisting that this service take place on terms of equality. And so while black men are mobilizing to join the Union Army and taking part in that story that we've come to love and celebrate and, and know pretty well, some of us, they're also doing something else. And that is, from outside the Army and from inside the Army, they're saying, this has got to be a fight that we participate in as equals. And if we can't participate in as equals, we're either not gonna, we're not gonna participate or we're gonna do so under protest. So, um, this guy, Robert Morris, has been fighting this fight for 10 years when the Civil War begins. He's desperate to start a militia company, a black militia company that can join the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia in the 1850s. And he tries every possible way to make this happen. He petitions the legislature, he recruits the men, he buys the uniforms. They keep trying to get the state legislature of Massachusetts to take the word white out of the state militia law that says all oh, white able-bodied men. Can't have that. Um, but they won't do it, because the federal militia law insists that that's the language. So the state just won't do it. And so Morris is caught. He wants to do it as a law-abiding citizen of the United States, 
And the terms of the law say he can't because he's not one. And so his campaign to start a militia unit fails, it falls apart, nothing ever comes of it. It's, it's just a, it's a meaningless story, except that in 1862 and 1863, when Governor Andrew, his friend, starts recruiting black men for the 54th, Robert Morris says, is it on terms of perfect equality? And Andrew says, I sure hope so. Let me check with the War Department. And the War Department says, mm -mm. no black officers. No black officers. And Morris says, then I'm not going. And none of my friends are going either. In 1861, when the Confederacy fires in Fort Sumter and the Civil War begins, uh, black men hold a protest meeting on Beacon Hill. And they, they volunteer as a home guard to defend Massachusetts against the Confederacy. It's a symbolic gesture. But 125 men sign up in one night. When the 54th starts registering men to, uh, to participate in Massachusetts in 1863, after the war has become a war to free the slaves, and with the promise later violated that they'll be given equal pay with white soldiers, 10 guys show up, 20. When the 54th marches through Boston in May of 1863 on their way to South Carolina, there are 40 out of a thousand from the city of Boston in its ranks. Morris's campaign against recruitment for the 54th succeeds. It succeeds so well that the leading black journalist of the time uh, says it's never to be too much regretted that a combination has prevented many black men from gaining this, this jewel of an opportunity to serve the Union in the first black regiment. I can't believe it's happened like this. And Robert Gould Shaw, the colonel of the 54th, says the leading colored men of Boston have done us more harm than good. That's Robert Morris, and that's the insistence on equality. But it happens within the regiments, too. And, well, I'm going to show you her picture, too. This is important. Um, it's not just the men who might serve as soldiers. It's also their wives. Her husband's Edward Bannister, a famous painter, but he wants to serve the Union Army. She's an entrepreneur. She's an activist. She stands up in a meeting, which not very many black women did in, in 1863. Um, but she stands up in a meeting. She says, I would rather my husband were dead than he go under these terms. If he can't go as an equal, he should not go. The stakes are too high. And the stakes, therefore, are not just about slavery. The stakes are about equality. Within the regiments, um, within the regiments, um, when it turns out that the black troops are, in fact, not going to be paid the same as white troops, they're not going to get the $13 a month that white troops uh, are, are paid, but in fact, they're going to be paid as military laborers, which means, effectively, they're going to be paid $7 a month more than half of what white soldiers are paid. Um, a strike begins in the, in the black regiments. Occasionally, actually, a mutiny, that is, a refusal, stacking arms and refusing to serve. But more often, a pay strike, a refusal to take those unequal pay envelopes. And this is really embarrassing to the Union, really embarrassing to the federal government, and really embarrassing to John Andrew, who has worked so hard to put the 54th Massachusetts together. So he sends his emissary down to the camp at the 55th Massachusetts in South Carolina, where, they're, where the non-commissioned officers are leading the strike, saying, we won't take our pay as long as it's unequal. And his adjutant goes down and talks to the men. Sergeant James Monroe Trotter says, you don't get it. It doesn't matter if the state of Massachusetts itself makes up the difference in pay. We're not in it for the money. This is about the principle. We're not mercenaries. This is about whether we're equal citizens or not. And Andrew's adjutant turns around and comes back to Massachusetts and says, I, I didn't understand what they were fighting about. Actually, I'm on their side. They win that fight. It takes 18 months. It's brutal. People are executed. It's, it's a really nasty fight. It doesn't finish with one pistol shot from Matthew Broderick, as in the movie Glory. Um, but they win that fight. And um, brings finally the Equalization Act of 1864. By war's end, as Frederick Douglass had predicted, um, black military service leads to citizenship. It leads to equal political citizenship. Um, the 13th Amendment passes uh, in, in, uh, in uh, December of 1865. Uh, it's followed by the 14th Amendment, uh, creating equal protection and due process in 1868, and the 15th Amendment, which bars racial discrimination and suffrage in 1870. And the principle of equality begins to enter the United States Constitution as a, as a function of uh, military service uh, and the, the campaign for equality that accompanied it. This is so successful that even during the war itself, Abraham Lincoln, who 18 months before was saying, 
go somewhere else, this ain't going to work. This is a white republic, and I can't change that if I would. Lincoln writes to the provisional governor of Louisiana, uh, occupied Louisiana, saying, I think actually maybe, don't you think that black men who served in our armies should be able to vote? And maybe more importantly, they would probably help in some trying time to come to keep the jewel of liberty within the family of freedom. That's huge. Think about that language. If black people are included in the family of freedom, they're no longer just outsiders, people who can be deported, exiled, you know, rendered you know, outside the body politic. They're actually part of the victorious coalition that represents freedom. And in the terms here, political equality as well. So by the end of the war, it seems commonplace to many white northerners, this is Harvard Weekly, uh, that black soldiers should be able to vote. Why not? Of course they should be able to. If not, then who? And not this man, right? But this is not the only thing happening, right? If it were, we live in a very different country. Um, there's a counter movement to all of this taking place from the get-go. And it's not just, or even primarily, a counter movement led by slaveholders and their descendants. Um, it, it's a movement that begins in the North during the Civil War with the New York City draft riots. Um, really a response to the, uh, the Union draft that uh, begins to be put into place in July of 1863. Um, but one whose campaign is waged not just against draft officials and against uh, leading white Republicans, but against the black population of New York City generally. As the sort of as the state goes for a war that's dragging so many uh, white uh, working men to war into their deaths, they burn the uh, orphanage for colored children, the colored orphan asylum, as it's called in New York City. Um, they string black men up from lampposts, lynching in the north in the midst of the Civil War. And formal equality comes to be undermined in law and in practice and in official pronouncement. In 1865, Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson, hosts a, a visiting delegation of, again, three black men uh, in the White House who are coming to ask for political equality as a sort of necessary concomitant to black freedom. And he says to them, the white people of the South have suffered enough. And to voice black suffrage on top of all else that they've lost that's just going to produce a war of races. You can't have it. And he fights tooth and claw against the principle of, of racial equality from then on. Ku Klux Klan, but also um, many uh, legal and even judicial decisions undermine the principle of legal equality almost as soon as it's established. In 1873, the United States Supreme Court effectively neutralizes the 14th Amendment in the Slaughterhouse Decision. Um, in 1883, after Congress returns and passes a new civil rights bill to try and restore what's been lost in the 1873 decision, in 1883, in the civil rights cases, the Supreme Court does it again. And it essentially says that to force owners of restaurants and hotels, et cetera, to accept black patrons if they don't want to is to violate those owners' rights under the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment becomes, as it remains today, um, a tool that supports the principle of racial equality and neutralizes any possibility of legislation uh, that could actually create the conditions for racial equality. Worst, I would say, um, formal equality turns out not to do what David Walker and his allies and successors thought it would do. That is, it does not bring social equality. It does not create the conditions in which that abolitionist interracial convention I showed you becomes normal rather than exceptional. Social equality is an ideal in the abstract that says all people are not just formally equal, but see each other and feel each other as equal in social life. It doesn't require any particular person to be friends with any other particular person, but it means that race doesn't become the boundary and the barrier uh, to fraternity, or sorrel activity in the way that it did, it did become. In fact, social equality very quickly becomes a slogan meaning black people pushing themselves where they don't want, which they therefore must be punished for. 
by the late 19th century, social equality means those things black people do that cause us to lynch them. It's already that way by 1869 when Republican President Ulysses S. Grant declares in his inaugural address that while of course we're for equality, we're not for anything like social equality. Every president after him will say the same thing. And where we're left is with this vision. This is a, a broadside rendering the Freedmen's Bureau, the, the federal government's effort to create an agency that would smooth the transition from slave labor to free labor in the South, creating ed conditions for education for former slaves, negotiating contracts between former slaveholders and former slaves, landholders and laborers. Um, it turns the Freedmen's Bureau, this broadside turns the Freedmen's Bureau into an agency for white workers servicing lackadaisical black people who don't know what to do with their freedom. The alternatives framed in here are you can either support the Negro or protect the white man. Politics is framed as a racial zero sum in which uh, to provide any measure of compensation or address any of the inequities forged by slavery becomes simply an injury to the white republic. This is from Pennsylvania, by the way, not from Georgia or Louisiana. Um, and that white republic persists. This is uh, Bloomberg Business Week um, from the spring of this year. This is an article on the great American housing rebound and how a new sort of house of cards is being built up in the housing industry. And the illustration used to, to speak to that housing rebound suggests precisely what the 1866 broadside against the Freedmen's Bureau does, which is that the problem and the thing causing uh, white economic liberty and prosperity to be in jeopardy is the lackadaisical behavior of people of color. In, in con conclusion, I'm going to leave that distasteful image in favor of one I prefer. Um, I don't know what the black activists of the 19th century, what, what people like Lewis Hayden would say if they were with us today. If they encountered an America in which one black man is president and one in three black men can expect to be incarcerated at some point in his life. Um, I do know what they wanted. They invented the idea that the American Republic should be a place where all citizens could participate freely and fully, not just be tolerated, uh, but be warmly embraced. They'd be daunted, <coughs> they, they would be daunted, by the challenges we face today, mass incarceration, just to name one. Um, but remember, they challenged a very successful and profitable hemispheric system of slavery, and they won they would not give up the fight, and neither should we. Thanks. And 
they do make a very serious effort in 1871 and 2 to suppress the Klan. In fact, they send, the federal, they send federal troops back into South Carolina, occupy a number of counties, they hold trials. Um, they, they destroy the Klan as the Klan, as a, as a political and social force in South Carolina, for a long time to come. But neither the Grant administration nor any of the other forces that fight the Klan on the ground in the 1870s know how to fight the Klan without becoming, in the view of many white residents of the South, tyrannical overlords. They don't know how to do it. If they don't, if they don't suspend the writ of habeas corpus, then local trial justices who are friendly to the Klan just let everybody go. If they do suspend the writ of habeas corpus, they're tyrants. It's a hard one to win. And um, as we know with all kinds of counterinsurgency campaigns in our own time, it's a very difficult one for an unpopular occupation force to, to win, and they don't. The Klan is destroyed in South Carolina. By 1873, the same men have been mobilized as rifle clubs, and they win. They shoot their way to power in 1876, and you know, they stay there for 100 years. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the attack on the Boston uh, courthouse and John Brown's raid. Um, do you do you have like any idea about which one was probably like, the most influential or like which one had the most impact in terms of like uh, African Americans trying to get that movement going and yeah. So. Well, that's two different questions. Let me see if I can take them in turn. Um, take the second one first. In terms of getting the movement going, I think the defense of fugitives is so critical, and we don't. We haven't placed that story centrally enough in our understanding of the 1850s and the crisis of the 1850s. But the willingness of black activists and a handful of white to literally make war on the federal government and on local officials in, in the service of, of fugitives' freedom uh, is, a, is a profoundly and friendly catalytic event. It's, a, it's as important as the war taking place in Kansas and Missouri for for unsettling the national consensus and making it clear that this could be a shooting war and not just a war of words. John Brown's raid comes at the end of that story and represents kind of its final flowering into kind of utopian, visionary, partly crazy um, effort to overthrow the system once and for all. It's a, it's a messianic vision that only a kind of Old Testament prophet like John Brown could have come up with. Um, John Brown's raid, though, is the most important thing that happens in the South before the Civil War, and for that reason is really critically important in American history. After John Brown's raid and the crackdown um, on free blacks, white northerners of all kinds uh, in the South, the, the, the Southern states are virtually in a state of kind of military preparedness from the end of 1859 you know, until they're defeated in 1865. Yeah. Can you talk a bit more about the role of white economic angst and ending reconstruction? White economic, sorry, what was the last word? Uh, angst, I think, was angst? the word I used. Okay. But yeah. Um, so the, one of the worst things that happens to reconstruction is that the same people who are building reconstruction, and to be honest, the same people who are fighting against reconstruction, Democrats and Republicans, are hip deep in a kind of Ponzi scheme that basically brings down the national economy. It's based on fraudulent railroad construction or railroad bonds. Uh, the Panic of 1873 crashes the national economy at the worst possible moment for the future of Reconstruction because it's been shown that certain kind of enforcement can actually produce conditions for free elections in the South. And once things get really hard on the northern home front, the appetite for further enforcement, the appetite for a campaign that should already have been won, in people's view, and was won in 1865, just disappears. People are very interested in deploying the army westward to engross Indian lands, and very interested in deploying the army northward to put down strikers who are unhappy with a growing inequality in northern society in the mid-1870s, but not at all interested in deploying troops uh, in the south again. So economic angst is a really important feature of the retreat from reconstruction in the south. It doesn't explain why there's money to deploy the federal army in lots of other places. Yeah? Can you speak to the uh, draft riots in uh, July of 63 and any impact they had going forward? So the, the draft riots in July 63 uh, 
could have been a much bigger deal than they were. Um, they're, uh, they, they were only really finally put down by troops who had just come from the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, for example. So if the Union had not won Gettysburg and those troops had not been available, what exactly would have happened in the city of New York is you know, kind of an open question. And draft rights are, are also important because they, they reveal the limits of a consensus around the policy of emancipation. They reveal that all across the lower north, there are many, many white northerners, including white northerners who have gone to war in the past, who don't think the war is worth fighting on these terms, or fighting much longer on these terms. Uh, and who in 1864 will support George McClellan for the presidency, not Abraham Lincoln. You know, Lincoln defeats McClellan and is reelected in 64, but it's, it's closer than you'd think. You know, he beats McClellan by 8, 10 points, but he doesn't cream him. McClellan gets, you know, close to a majority of the Union popular vote. <coughs> that means that there are a lot of people in the Union, most of them white, who want the war to end sooner rather than later and don't particularly care on what terms it ends. So the draft rights are very revealing of that underlying political reality in the Union, which is that Lincoln's war, which we have sanctified, uh, was not that popular. There was a majority in support of it, but not a broad consensus. I think that's the main lesson of the draft rights. Yeah? Uh, back to the, one of the first slides from that. Yeah. How many African Americans are on it? I was just wondering why there weren't as many in there as there were on yeah. the coast. Um, so there's a couple of reasons for that. You'll notice that there are quite a lot of African Americans inland in the south, in the growing lands of the south, right? Along the Mississippi, uh, along the Mississippi River, um, in uh, good growing lands in central Tennessee, all the way in the upper of South Carolina, right? But there are, in fact, large black populations scattered, you know, well inland in the slave states, right? But not all, but nearly all African Americans who came to the United States came as slaves. And nearly all of them came to places in the 18th century where slavery could make a serious profit as a plantation industry. And that meant places where a plantation crop would be profitably grown, and that meant mostly Maryland on south, and then later on west. That meant that the initial population of black people in the North, never that large to begin with, didn't grow much um, after the early 18th century. Um, grew by natural increase, but not that much. Um, and uh, the, the map reflects that reality. The map reflects the reality that most black people came as slaves and were slaves until 1865. Um, and in places where there was no demand for slaves or where slavery was illegal, there were also very few black people. That's, that's really the, the bottom line. Yeah. By talking about this in terms of the United States, and much yeah. of this story so far is very self contained mm -hmm. um, and types of Caribbean interests. Um, of course, to what thank extent you. Yes. is there um, a, a more gen kind of spheric um, discussion or an Atlantic dimension yeah. to um, this, and how much of their, how much black solidarity is there um, that goes beyond the United States? Right. Um, here, I want to bring David Walker back on colored citizens of the world, right? Now, Walker neither really addresses much of the world, nor does he address what he means by citizen in any explicit way. These are gestures, but they're important gestures. Because Walker, like everybody else in his world, in his black world, and later on in his black and white abolitionist world, knows about the Haitian Revolution. And he knows about what Walker doesn't know, but his successors know about West Indian emancipation and they know about slave revolt in Jamaica, and they know about slave revolt in Demerara, and they know about slave revolt everywhere it happens, because they're paying as close attention to that reality as Southern slaveholders are. They are keenly attuned to a broad diasporic freedom struggle taking place. Now, they would like to see that as a common freedom struggle, and they, you know, like, like diasporan intellectuals then and now imagine that the connections are close. In fact, in Boston, they are close. You know, people come back and forth between Haiti and Boston all the time. And the connections between Boston, the Northeast, and New York, and Haiti, and Liberia are through educational institutions and personnel, Masonic lodges, 
uh, Christian denominations. It happens in all kinds of different ways, right? Um, it's complicated by the fact that Haiti, the most important seat of slave revolt, is Catholic and French speaking, right? That complicates things a little bit for, for mainly Protestant and often quite nativist pro, uh, you know, uh, English speakers. But um, there is a strong awareness and desire for uh, a connection across those boundaries. It doesn't take place in the register of the nation. It takes place in the register of Masonic brethren, Christians, um, seekers after education and enlightenment, those kinds of, those kinds of uh, contexts. What do you, what do you, tell me more. Well, no, I'm just, I wonder, do you think that there's actually more of a um, international um, solidarity among African Americans um, mm -hmm. than among white Americans? Oh, it, well, depends how you look at it, right? Because white Americans have their own vision of an international freedom struggle going on at the same moment in the revolutions of 48. Right, they're looking at the liberal and sometimes socialist revolutions in Europe and saying, yes. And people are coming from those revolutions to the United States, filling up the Union Army, by the way, um, uh, right, and, and, and take part in that. So there are, there, it's, I haven't thought about it this way before, but there are two simultaneous kind of racial, racial internationalisms taking place in this moment. Um, they're, they're just oriented quite differently because the problem confronting one is the tyranny of slaveholding and that the problem confronting the other is the tyranny of monarchy and its despotism, right? And they're, they're talked about in the same terms, as though Hungarian uh, subjects of the, uh, of the Hungarian Empire are slaves, but they're not, right? So the, the metaphor breaks down in the same way that it breaks down in the American Revolution, with, you know, where Britain's never, never, never shall be slaves, we'll just carry them on our ships, right? What else? Thank you.